John Jordan. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Brett. Uh, I'm a big fan of AOM's podcasts. Well, I appreciate that. So you got a biography. It's a okay. It's kind of hard. This is a history book, but it's also a biography. It's called Brothers, Rivals, Victors. Eisenhower, Patton, Bradley, and the partnership that drove the Allied conquest in Europe. When I read this book, it's really interesting because it's it's a biography because you do do individual biographies about each of these men, but it's also interesting because it's a biography about the relationship between these three guys, Eisenhower, Patton, and Bradley. What what led you to write about the relationship these three men had during, well, I guess, before the war and during the war? Yeah, it was a long and intriguing relationship between Eisenhower and Bradley going back to the, really the f- summer of 1911, and then Eisenhower and Patton at the very end of World War I. And uh, I didn't set out to write a, a triography, so to speak. I mean, I, I began reading about these guys because as a kid growing up in the 1970s, Dad was off flying planes in the Air Force, and uh, for better or for worse, I spent a lot of time watching television. We only had four channels back then. And there were a lot of these World War II movies that uh, were very popular. And so I'd see these heroic guys like, like Patton or Nimitz or MacArthur. And as I got a little bit older, I wondered, what, what were these guys really like when they weren't heroically standing on the bridge of the USS Yorktown, you know, watching Japanese planes get shot down? Uh, when they went back to their offices, were they jealous were they scared? Who did they blow off steam to? Uh, what happens when they you know, take their helmet off and put their feet up on the desk? And so I started reading about uh, Eisenhower and Patton and then, then Bradley after that and realized that there are some very fine biographies written about each of them. But what seemed to be escaping the story was their relationship with each other. And while we're not always necessarily defined by our relationships, Relationships certainly do affect who we are and and how we behave. And I, I found out that this long and uh, sort of evolving relationship between these three generals had a uh, strong impact on the way World War II played out in Western Europe. Well, so let's start talking about the relationships. So Eisenhower and Patton, let's talk about that relationship. As you said, they were friends before World War II, right after World War I. How did that relationship start and what was the attraction between the two guys? You know, Eisenhower and Patton were in some ways kind of the odd couple. You wouldn't normally expect to see them in the same circles together because their backgrounds were very different. Patton grew up uh, in a small, wealthy family in Southern California, never had to work outside the home. He had uh, one sister who, in a sort of twist of history, uh, dated uh, General Blackjack Pershing and almost married him. But Patton had a deep sense of family history, social connections, and uh, he also grew up kind of as a as an introvert. Eisenhower, on the other hand, came from a middle class family from uh, Middle America, Kansas. Uh, there were seven boys in his family, no girls. He had a very strong sense of community, unlike Patton. And uh, while he was a tough kid, he also learned to rely on allies like his older brothers when dealing with the neighborhood bullies. So, so their their personalities grew up very differently. They both went to West Point, and then after graduation, their careers were very different. Patton had a meteoric career in the Army after West Point. He became the Army's master of the sword. He was an excellent fencer. He redesigned the cavalry saber. Saber represented the United States in the 1912 Olympics in Stockholm in the modern pentathlon. He finished fifth. Then he joined General Blackjack Pershing's expedition against Pancho Villa in Mexico. When he went off to World War I, he commanded a tank battalion, but on the first day of the Meuse-Argonne offensive, a Mauser bullet found its way to him and put him out of action. So he missed most of the First World War. Now, Eisenhower, was a, uh, he was a, a team sport guy. He loved baseball, especially loved football. He was a small-time uh, football coach because during, uh, during his playing career at West Point, he had been in some big games against Jim Thorpe who had played for the Carlisle Indian School then. This was his passion, team sports and especially football. But But he had a knee injury while he was at West Point, and that put him on the sidelines and essentially forced him to become a cheerleader, a manager, and a coach. And so after graduating from West Point, uh, Eisenhower became kind of a small-time football coach at these little army posts, and that developed his training skills. 
he ended up missing World War I because the uh, U.S. Army didn't want him going off to fight the Kaiser. They wanted having other men to fight the Kaiser. And so Ike ended up training men with the U.S. Tank Corps in Camp Meade, Maryland. And after World War I, tanks is really what brought the two men together. They both developed their initial professional interest based on this new snorting mechanical beast the Army called tanks. And uh, they developed these theories about what a tank could do in the next war. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we kind of reiterate some of the things you talked about, these guys, their personalities. So Patton, yeah, I think a lot of people, he was an individual sport guy. You kind of reiterate that throughout the book that he didn't really do team sports. He was, and I thought it was interesting too, you said he was an introvert, but this guy was larger than life. He did enjoy holding the limelight whenever you could get it. He did. Um, he, he, he used to say, I'd rather be uh, looked at than overlooked. And uh, to Patton, in some ways, there is, to some extent, no such thing as bad publicity, at least growing up. He would uh, bring attention to himself, at least in Eisenhower's view, through uh, crude and obscene language. He liked to, as Ike once said, to explode a few rounds of profanity in polite society. And if nobody paid any attention, he'd just kind of move on. But if somebody noted it or reacted to it, he would keep doing more of the same. Throughout his life, General George Marshall's wife, Catherine Marshall, and then Patton's father and, and Ike Eisenhower would tell Patton over and over, you've got to watch what you say. You've got to have the gravitas of a senior leader and that, that penchant for attracting uh, sometimes bad publicity like nails to a magnet was to dog Patton throughout his career. Patton, of course, could pay for any mistakes he made while the war was going on and while he was generating victories. But in the absence of uh, battles to fight and, and, and win, it, was a, uh, it could be a problem for him, and it, as it is a problem for any modern general. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk more about that as we get into World War II and we talk about how Eisenhower's and Patton's relationship developed then. So let's talk about uh, this this love affair for the tank. So both these guys thought the tank was the future of warfare, but that butted heads or went against like army doctrine at the time, correct? Yeah, after the First World War, and again, remember, uh, Patton had fought in that some, Eisenhower did not. The The two men looked at tanks as being some new, a new device that could basically take the role of the shock cavalry from the medieval times, the, the armored horse. It could drive deep into the enemy's rear echelons. It uh, had a lot of uh, shock power. And that went against army doctrine at the time, which, based on the First World War, said the tank is only there to support the infantrymen. And if the infantrymen can only move at a four or five mile an hour pace, then the tank doesn't need to go any faster than that. So they were kind of heretics for a while. And that uh, heresy between Patton, uh, Eisenhower, and a few other of the the real tank aficionados was something that uh, brought the two men very close and kind of created a relationship that lasted almost to the end of their lives. So as you said, these two guys were pretty much completely different. Eisenhower, more about alliances, working with others, Patton, wanted to be the star, individ- an individualist. But as you're talking about the book, both these guys missed the war, World War I. Did they talk about that? And did they, did they think that their chance at, I mean, were they very conscious about wanting to do something great? Like they wanted, they both wanted to be great generals. And did they talk about that uh, after World War I? Like, you know, are we going to get our chance? Yeah, they did. Uh, Patton and Eisenhower, when they were stationed together at uh, Camp Meade, used to talk about uh, not if there's another war, and of course, World War I was called the war to end all, world, all wars, but they would talk about when the war came and what would be their role. And they used to exchange letters. One point later on, Patton wrote Eisenhower and said, in the next war, I'll be the Stonewall Jackson and you can be the Robert E. Lee. Ike, you do the big planning and uh, you let me go in and shoot up the enemy. So they they believed that there would be another war, but like many officers, they were kind of let down. Patton actually went into a sort of depression when he came back to the United States because he felt that his great role was to be a, a great general. Eisenhower sort of had that feeling, though not as intensely as Patton experienced it, because Eisenhower was what you'd call kind of a late bloomer. He te- he he became an intellectual on military matters as his relationship with Patton went along. 
And then as he uh, developed his own mind through through other mentors in his career. But uh, the two men at first saw other other folks coming back from World War I with chestfuls of medals and promotions. And uh, there was definitely a sense that uh, they had been shortchanged. So I thought that was interesting too that Patton, even before World War II, kind of predicted what the relationship would be like uh, in a future war, right? Because that's how it ended up. Patton, Patton was the Stonewall Jackson and Eisenhower was sort of the big picture General Lee guy. Exactly. And uh, I think I think they both had a sense even early on that Eisenhower was a guy whose mind could was broader than Patton's. Patton loved battles and he was kind of very, very single minded in that regard. As Eisenhower developed in the 1920s, uh, he went to Leavenworth, or where the Command and General Staff School was, went to the Army War College, and he developed a broad sense of what a war in a democracy requires. He learned about industrial mobilization. He wrote a paper on how to develop a citizen army based around the National Guard and how you would do a mass mobilization if the country needed it. When Eisenhower was stationed in Washington in the late 20s and early 30s, he learned something about politics and how the War Department operated. And he had mentors that Patton didn't have, and he had a a facility for learning from generals, from sergeants, from industrialists, how a big war would be run and how we would run it with allies. Whereas Patton uh, consistently came back to the theme of, I want to command armies in a battle and George thought of himself as a battlefield captain, as opposed to a sort of chairman of the board that Eisenhower became. So in this sense, they were, they were brothers. Like they had an appreciation for their differences. But at the same time, there's that rival component. And it seems like both of them, even early on in the relationship, kind of had a contempt for each other as well for their differences. Dur- during the, the 20s and 30s, when they didn't have to run into each other too much, they, they both knew each other's limitations, but they were also good friends. Uh, The families had uh, spent time together at Camp Mead. The Eisenhower uh, toddler was doted on by Patton's daughters. Beatrice Patton and and Mamie Eisenhower knew each other. So they were social friends. They knew they could count on each other, but they were cognizant of each man's limitations. And the the way those limitations brushed up against their, their personal friendship grew into sharper focus the further up in the command chain they went. So let's talk about Eisenhower and Bradley. So you mentioned they got they got to know each other in 1911 at West Point. How did that happen? Did they just go to school together? Were they playing football? What was going on there? You know, you know they both beca- met each other about the t- same time they put on their cadet uniforms in August of 1911. Uh, they were both fairly tall for their age, so they uh, were assigned to the same cadet company. They became very good friends, and it was mostly through their love of sports. Omar Bradley uh, liked, like I liked football, but his real passion was on the diamond, not the gridiron. Bradley held the record for the longest West Point throw for a long time. Throughout his college career, he swung his Louisville slugger to a 333 batting average. Uh, he was actually a little bit better student and cadet than Eisenhower. He, he outranked Eisenhower their senior year, but their love of team sports really cemented that kind of friendship. The other thing that uh, that they had in common after graduation is that Bradley, like Eisenhower, totally missed out on the First World War. He was stationed uh, with an infantry regiment in Montana and Iowa, basically spent the war guarding a copper mine. And about the time his regiment was was ready to ship out to Europe, the bells rang out in, uh, in celebration of the armistice. So both uh, Ike and Brad thought that their failure to get into World War II had uh, damaged, if not uh, possibly ruined their careers. They, they thought that for a little while. And tell us a little bit more about Bradley's personality, because this is a general that, you know, he's one of the greats, but he, unlike Patton or Eisenhower, people sort of, I don't know, ignore him or glance over him. Yeah, he, he was the kind of guy who would never call attention to himself. Bradley grew up in a very poor part of central Missouri. His father died when Brad was 14, and he had to shoot small game in the woods to uh, sell to his neighbors to help make ends meet. His mother had to take in borders, so they weren't prominent either socially or economically the way uh, uh, Eisenhower's family was well-known in Abilene, Kansas, and the Pattons were a wealthy family. When Brad was 17, he, had, he was involved in a skating accident that 
tr- basically smashed up his teeth and they didn't have the money to get his teeth repaired. And, and so he was always self-conscious about his smile. And if you ever see pictures of Omar Bradley, uh, if he's smiling, he usually keeps his lips together. So with that kind of background, Omar Bradley never developed the social confidence of a Patton who was wealthy and well-connected, or even an Eisenhower who grew up with a strong social net. And while that's something that, uh, you know, as a kid, you expect maybe will grow out of a little bit, and, and Bradley did grow out of that some, it came into sharper focus when he moved up to the very high levels of the Army's command structure and had to work with the British, many of whom were well-educated, they spoke French, they were very self- socially self-confident. And because of that, Bradley was more the kind of guy who was comfortable teaching, teaching math teaching uh, his his uh, junior officers about a plan he had put together. He was more of the professorial type who kind of liked to stay uh, out of the limelight. And he was a team player, a big-time team player. Absolutely. Uh, Bradley believed that, I mean, that, that, was, that was what he loved in uh, West Point and growing up. He was a baseball player. He believed there was a time for a certain amount of individual accomplishment, but it all had to be within the framework of a team. And that really came into sharp focus uh, once uh, the stakes became high, when when the, the three men were commanding uh, multiple divisions and there were things going on in a very big, uh, you know, on a big scale in Western Europe. Uh, so Bradley's team's, uh, team orientation served him very well. And, and it was reflected later on because he, he grew up as the kind of general who relied on his staff members to do a lot of the work. He wasn't the type to insert himself, except in in fairly isolated instances, if his staff told him that uh, something was going on or that something needed to be done, he generally took their recommendations because he trusted them. So let's talk about Patton and Bradley. When did they first meet and start working together? Was it before the war or did their their relationship start when World War II started? Well, Brett, prior to World War II, the Army was fairly small. After uh, 1920, we demobilized the World War I Army. So the officer corps, even in the days before emails and texts and the internet, they were able to keep up with each other reasonably well. And Patton and Bradley first met each other in the mid-1920s when they were both stationed with the Hawaii Division. Patton was organizing a trap shooting team, and a major named Omar Bradley showed up to try out for it. Now, Brad was one of the Army's crack shots with the Springfield rifle. He was just, he, he, he went through his life being one of their, their better uh, rifle and shotgun men. And Bradley uh, was a little bit nervous when he first started trying out. He missed the first two clays. Uh, but then after that, he hit the next 23 in a row. And Patton was watching Bradley and just kind of shrugged and said, Bradley remembered it with sort of a condescending tone. Okay, I think you'll do. And that was sort of their introduction. And after that, Brad and Patton never really hit it off socially because they just ran in very different cliques, but, and, and they had very different uh, professional differences. Patton w- grew up in the cavalry, and uh, that was sort of how he thought of things. A horse, of course, is a big, beautiful animal, and it's very strong and powerful, but it eats a lot of food, and it uh, can get shot up on a battlefield if it's left in one place too long. And Patton's mentality was that an army is a lot like a horse. You uh, have to keep it moving. You have to drive toward the enemy rear, or it's going to consume its supplies and get shot up very quickly. So to Patton, attack, attack, attack was his, his method of operating. Bradley professionally came up through the infantry. And as an infantryman, Brad had a foot soldier's appreciation for the vulnerability of the human body under fire. So Brad took the approach of of careful planning. He didn't like to take unnecessary risks. He liked to keep his flanks secured and keep good lines of supply. And he always wanted to make sure that there was a solid plan before he moved too quickly. So the, the personal differences and the professional differences between inf- uh, infantryman Omar Bradley and horse soldier George Patton were other dividing lines between the two's personality. And this would be, you'd see this throughout the, the rest, throughout World War II. Well, let's talk about that. So World War II starts, how did these three men 
connect there? Was it just by chance that they all got assigned to Europe or was that sort of the way they were, you know, started their military career was destined that these three men would be working together? You know, it was the personal connections between the three prior to World War II that had a huge impact on their working together once the shooting started. Uh, before World War II, in, in 1940 to 1941, Eisenhower had come back from the Philippines. He had been working as a staffer for MacArthur. He was kind of burned out uh, on staff work. He really wanted to get into the field. And Patton had become the, the nation's preeminent tank division commander. And Eisenhower was basically begging Patton for a job with his, with his tank as a regimental commander in uh, Patton's tank uh, division. And throughout their, their correspondence, uh, Patton said, look, I'd like to get you in any capacity as I can, Ike. You're a smart guy. I'd love to have you as my chief of staff, but if you want to take a chance, then maybe the Army will put you in as a regimental uh, commander under me, and I'll be happy to do it because you'll be valuable. But the Army had different thoughts, and, and the Army saw Eisenhower's ability to plan, and General George Marshall pulled Eisenhower from uh, uh, from a post in San Antonio, Texas, up to Washington and said, I need you to help me plan the invasion of North Africa. Well, when Eisenhower was doing that, he was in close proximity to Marshall. And uh, one of the guys he wanted as uh, his, his horseman in this uh, three-ring circus of North Africa was George Patton because Eisenhower trusted him. When Eisenhower brought over uh, Patton into North Africa, the Allies uh, invaded. We were uh, stuck in Tunisia for a while. And uh, kind of the beginning of the movie Patton with uh, George C. Scott starts out with Patton coming over to sort of take over things in Tunisia. And one of the people who was hanging around the American headquarters in Tunisia was Omar Bradley. Bradley had been sent from the War Department to serve as Eisenhower's eyes and ears among the uh, Tunisian forces. And uh, Eisenhower loved to have Bradley back with him because he trusted uh, trusted Bradley. And uh, Patton knew Bradley and said, look, instead of having you as Ike's spy, I want you as my deputy commander. And so that's how that personal relationship that went back to the 20s and even the 19-teens came back around full circle with Eisenhower moving up to being the supreme commander uh, Patton as the senior army commander, and then Bradley working under Patton as his understudy, essentially. So, I mean, it's interesting because uh, you mentioned there, in the beginning, before World War II started, Eisenhower was wanting to work under Patton, but in, Eisenhower ended up being Patton's boss. And so that was kind of interesting, like, tension throughout the war. Both, all three of these men were ambitious. They wanted to leave a mark. In, the, in their military career, and they wanted to, you know, gain rank. So what was that tension like when, you know, say Patton was like, okay, yeah, Ike, come work for me, but then Ike ended up being Patton's boss, or Bradley ended up being, you know, working under Patton, or then Bradley, you know, was Patton's boss. How did, what was that tension like throughout World War II? In, in Eisenhower's case, it worked out pretty well because Ike had a very different role from Patton's. Patton's was to was to capture an area to destroy an army it was he had specific missions to accomplish eisenhower had to sort of work in a supervisory role so they were able to get along pretty well but there was always that army chain of command that was uh, that they couldn't escape from uh, occasionally eisenhower would tell patton look you're you're shooting off at the mouth too much you're ruining your credibility by acting like you're just spouting off when you and I both know you've thought about these things, but you say them in a flippant way. So you need to, you, you need to work, work on that, work on your approach, have some more gravitas, uh, work, as, uh, work on your image. And uh, Patton groused about that. He thought Eisenhower was kind of getting a little bit big for his britches. He wrote his wife, Beatrice, that he, he's, Patton said, I think I could do a better job as Supreme Commander but I certainly don't want the job. So, you know, that relationship was always going to be a little bit tense, but it also had some benefits because later on when uh, Patton got into trouble for some things he had done or said, 
Eisenhower would be there to protect him because he understood Patton's strengths and wanted to keep Patton in the fight. He would also, uh, as, he, as Eisenhower told General George Marshall, when it came to controlling Patton and tempering some of his more damaging uh, attributes, I can be rougher with Patton than anybody else could without my having to ask for them to be fired and sent home. I can, because of our friendship, I can uh, give him sort of the straight scoop. Yeah. And that, I mean, there was some definite, like really, you know, Eisenhower given Patton the big time straight scoops. There's that one moment, I think, was it after the incident where Patton slapped the the guy in the hospital and he was pretty much on the chopping block and Eisenhower summoned him to the office and basically said, look, I'm going to give you one last chance. And uh, Patton just started crying, <laughs> gave Eisenhower a big hug. Yeah, yeah. I, Eisenhower had done that a, no, a number of times, and he had kind of a standard procedure for what he called jacking up George Patton. Patton had slapped a couple of enlisted men in uh, two different hospitals in Sicily whom he thought were malingering. The idea of, of post-traumatic stress wasn't really a concept that Patton understood, and so that got him in a lot of trouble. Eisenhower went to bat with Patton, the newspapers were going to report that and basically sink Patton's career. And Eisenhower sat down with the journalist and said, look, I'm not going to censor any story you choose to write, but I do want you to know that Patton is very, very valuable to the Allied war effort. We don't have very many generals like him. So you can write the story, but I want you to know that it's going to be damaging. And Eisenhower had such a good way with the press and, and the press were very patriotic people. They considered themselves Americans first and journalists second. And they said, Eisenhower, if you tell us that it's going to hurt the war effort for us to print this story about Patton slapping people around, then we'll not only bury the story, we'll deny it existed. And so Eisenhower saved Patton's scalp that time. Then uh, about six months later, Patton got into, an, into trouble again. He had made some comments about after the war, the Americans and the English would rule the world. He apparently said, and the Russians, but the reporter who was listening to him didn't pick up that part of the, uh, the, the comment and uh, created a big uproar in the American newspapers. And again, Eisenhower had to, had to basically put George up on the scaffold, put his head down on the block, and then, then give him a reprieve of execution. And he could do that because he recognized Patton's value to the team. So, you know, throughout the war, these guys remained friends. Whenever they would get together, they'd have these, you know, they just stay up late into the night and early morning drinking and just talking about the war and just other things. But as you mentioned earlier, their relationship started to change and those differences those acknowledgments of the limitations each men had became more focused. So how did that relationship change? Was there a moment when, you know, Eisenhower and Patton's friendship ended and it was just basically a professional relationship? Yeah, there were a couple of flashpoints in their relationship. And it, it morphed almost not not just because of, of the positions they held, but also the jobs they were forced to do. In Western Europe in 1944 and 1945, Eisenhower's job was to look out for the, the entire Allied force. And that include the British, the Canadians, a lot of people other than just the Americans. And uh, his, his friend, Omar Bradley, as much of a team player as Bradley was, Bradley always had a little bit of professional jealousy or, or at least some professional tension with not so much Eisenhower, but with Bradley's natural rival, British General Bernard Montgomery, who was at the same level, basically, as, as Omar Bradley. And so when Eisenhower would do something that uh, the two men felt favored the British, they would get together, they'd grouse about Ike, how he was, he was uh, he'd ba basically gone native with the British. And uh, that rubbed in, in Omar Bradley's craw for a bit. And it really threw out the, the campaign through the fall of 1944. And a flashpoint came up, and it was, it was really something that was a, a harsh blow to their relationship during the time of the Battle of the Bulge. Now, in December 1944, Omar Bradley's uh, first U.S. Army was uh, hit in the center of its line by a surprise attack from the Germans. The papers called it the Battle of the Bulge because it, it drove back the American lines. And it was, it was a big blow 
to Bradley's prestige. It was a, it was a bloody affair for the Americans. And uh, because Bradley's headquarters was south of the Bulge, but his main armies were north of the Bulge, Eisenhower took two of Bradley's three armies, 1st and the Ninth U.S. Armies, commanded by uh, Generals Hodges and, and General Simpson, and gave those to Bernard Montgomery. And that infuriated Bradley. He uh, called up Eisenhower and he said, Ike, if you're going to take my armies away from me, I can't be responsible for this battle. I resign. And uh, Eisenhower, who kind of sensed that his old friend was blowing off steam, said, Brad, your resignation doesn't mean anything to me. You're going to continue to do your job. And uh, he was able to placate Bradley a bit. He had Winston Churchill say some good things about Bradley in the House of Commons. And eventually, Bradley was able to get his armies back. But Eisenhower did something he knew would infuriate his old friend because he felt that was what victory needed. During that time, it was a a very tough blow to their personal friendship. But sometimes the guy at the top has to make those decisions. With Patton, Eisenhower uh, kept a pretty good relationship throughout the war. But then after the war... Patton's mouth was getting him into trouble that he didn't have any victories to offset. And in uh, October of 1945, after the war had ended, Patton made some comments about being soft on the Nazis and hard on the communists, and papers again got in an uproar. And Eisenhower uh, very, uh, very sadly had to fire his, his friend Patton. He relieved him from command of the 3rd U.S. Army, and that really ended their relationship as friends. And and Eisenhower hated to be the one holding the axe, but he felt that that was what the allies needed in the interest of political harmony. How did uh, Patton and Brad's relationship change throughout the war? You know, Brett, that was an interesting uh, kind of dynamic because Bradley started out his fighting career in the Second World War as Patton's understudy in Tunisia. Then they moved over to the invasion of Sicily, and Patton was the 7th U.S. Army commander. Bradley, again, was working underneath Patton. Patton was only interested in the attack, in the tactics, and not too interested in things like how could Brad's forces get air cover and air support, and what about the communication lines, and how do we get supplies to to Omar Bradley's men? And Bradley found more and more things that uh, he just didn't like about Patton's management style, and uh, those really got under his uh, under his uh, collar. And when Bradley came back during a uh, during a short leave to the United States, he spent a lot of time with General Marshall talking about the bad things that Patton was doing overseas, and it didn't really change what uh, happened with Patton, but uh, it did make. Both Eisenhower and Marshall believed that maybe Patton wasn't the guy to lead the invasion of Northwest Europe during uh, Operation Overlord, the big D-Day invasion. Maybe we ought to use Patton in in a striking role as kind of a a cut-and-thrust cavalry type, Uh, but let's let Omar Bradley start the uh, invasion for uh, for the Americans. But it was interesting, too. So there was that, you know, that Bradley... I don't know, sort of resented Patton for his differences. But at the same time, both Patton and Bradley had a disdain for Eisenhower's, you know, what they called his, his cozying up with the British. They didn't think he was American enough. So they had that thing in common. Yeah, exactly. They 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 both had kind of a common enemy in, in Omar Bradley. I, I'm, I'm sorry, in uh, Bernard Montgomery. Monty was uh, a very selfish general. He was the type of person that not just Americans disliked. Uh, some of his worst critics were the uh, British air and naval uh, commanders under Eisenhower's uh, supreme command. And during the Sicily invasion, Patton and Montgomery were equals. Montgomery ran the British 8th Army, Patton ran the American 7th Army. And so they had this rivalry there. They always were worried about the British getting more credit and belittling the Americans. And they felt the Americans had a right to show what they could do. Then when we get to Northwestern Europe in the battles for France and Germany, now Bradley and Montgomery are on an equal footing And it was Bradley who was grousing about uh, Montgomery and Ike's pro-Britishness. And while Bradley and Ike always had their friendship, and that never really changed that much until the, at least until the 
the uh, Battle of the Bulge, both I, both Patton and Bradley sort of had this common foe that they could grouse about uh, with each other uh, without having to worry whether that was going to be a you know something that they would differ about later. They both had a, a sort of a common enemy. So, how do you think these three men's relationships like? You know, because it was, it's really interesting because it was like, you know, there's Bradley and Patton teaming up against Eisenhower in some instances, but then Eisenhower, they're all working together. How do you think that relationship influenced the war? I mean, it, if, it, if it weren't for these three guys being together, do you think things would have ended up differently? I know that's kind of hard to guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even in a, a what if scenario, I think if you look back to what Eisenhower thought and, and wrote after the war about his different generals, he saw Patton as being one of America's greatest pursuit generals ever, kind of like Napoleon's Marshal Marat, just a guy who would who would overcome any obstacle and chase the enemy down, never give him rest and hound him. And so when when looking at what we ought to do to, uh, to uh, invade Hitler's fortress, Europe, Eisenhower thought of Patton as the kind of guy who we, should, who we shouldn't put into a static fight. We, we can't let have him, we don't want him as a, a close-in slugger. We want him as somebody who can go tear into the enemy. So the question was, who would be our close-in slugger? And uh, Eisenhower believed that Omar Bradley was the right type for that. The, the thing that their relationships did was give them a good picture of each other's strengths and weaknesses. And so Eisenhower would be able to tell General Marshall back in Washington, Patton is the right guy for, for the role of a deep pursuit. And Patton did that when he uh, charged through the Loire Valley, charged up to the Seine River, helped enable the capture of Paris. He was the kind of guy who we want in that role. And Omar Bradley's the one who we want for a slugfest, whether it's in the uh, along the Siegfried line of of Germany, whether it's in the hedgerow country of Normandy. Eisenhower said, "I trust Brad to be the right guy with the right balance to be able to uh, get the job done." So this is a biography of relationships, but this is also you know three separate biographies of three great leaders. I'd like to talk about what are, do you think are the big leadership lessons we can take from each of these guys, you know, like what they did well and what did they, they do poorly? So let's start with Eisenhower. Yeah, with Eisenhower, Brett, uh, one of the best leadership lessons is that once you've got a cause that you can believe in, that you can put your heart into, it's important to subordinate yourself to the greater good. Eisenhower had plenty of times when he would come back infuriated, red in the face, swearing up a, a, a cloud of cuss words, and he could cuss as well as, as Patton could, and uh, over Omar Brad, I, I'm sorry, over uh, General Montgomery. Montgomery w- was just the kind of guy who would infuriate people, and Eisenhower, time and again, subordinated his temper. He, he played nicely with Montgomery and, and supported him wholeheartedly when he felt that that was what was necessary for victory. I think another lesson from Eisenhower is that leadership comes in many forms. Ike always wanted to be the field general. He wanted to be a guy kind of like Patton who would get out and uh, and, and could, could direct a battle. But what he learned over his career is that sometimes what we're good at and sometimes what we want to do are two different things. And Eisenhower learned that while he may have envisioned a general as a person who points to a spot on a map and says, we attack here, he learned that uh, there are different forms of leadership. And his had to be the type of leader who was a conciliator, who could understand the problems that the Navy, that the Air Force, that the logistical people, that the civilian infrastructure had. And he could make sure that everybody was happy enough to, to play together and could get what they needed to, to, to get the job done. Eisenhower was basically the the type who today we would see as uh, like a chairman of a big Fortune 50 company. And he had a skill set that uh, the other two didn't have. And what about Patton? With Patton, there are a couple of uh, a couple of lessons here that sort of get overlooked in this kind of two-dimensional character we have that uh, is, is really marked by the way George C. Scott portrayed him in the, the 1970 film. The first one is that to be successful, you've got to have a lot of depth. You've really got to, you, you've really got 
to to put your 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 thoughts, your your mind, your reading into what you're doing. Uh, Patton, we don't really see this much in in either the movie Patton or uh, you know kind of our popular image of him. But he was very much an intellectual. He read a lot of history. He incorporated historical lessons into what he would do, the plans he would make. When he was, he was the type of guy who, when driving down the countryside in a car, he would look out at the terrain and think, how would I defend that? How would I attack that? Patton had an awful lot of intellectual depth that, that underlay the, uh, the dashing things he did and the things we remember him for, the relief of Bastogne, the conquest of Messina and Sicily, and so on. But the other lesson from Patton is kind of a negative one, and that's that you can have a lot of depth but if you don't portray that yourself as as someone with that depth, if you don't project that depth, then it can get lost in uh, your message. And uh, time and time again, Patton would have problems with uh, what he would say that would get in the way of his message. A great example of that is when when Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton were trying to figure out what to do with with, with the uh, Battle of the Bulge, how to respond to the Germans. Well, uh, when he got to Patton, Eisenhower said, George, what, what can you do? We'd, we'd like to make an attack north from your sector. How soon can you attack? And Patton said, I can move in three days with three divisions. Well, everybody in the room knew that you couldn't really do that on the fly. You just you, There were too many plans that had to be set. You had to figure out road networks and who got to use them. You had to stockpile supplies. Everybody knew that Patton was just spouting off about how soon he could get to Bastogne and and save the 101st Airborne that was holed up there against the Germans. But what they didn't realize is that before Patton had come to meet with Eisenhower, he had talked it over with his staff. He said, let's come up with contingency plans. And he did an awful lot of groundwork there that the other people in the room didn't know about, the British and, and Eisenhower's other staffers. And so when Patton sort of popped off a what looked like a flippant remark, it undercut the fact that he had done a lot of homework before giving that answer. And so projecting that kind of, of seriousness is something that, uh, that, that hampered Patton's effectiveness as, as brilliant as he was as a field commander. And what about Omar Bradley? What lessons can we take from him? With Bradley, one of the best lessons is that once you get a team of smart people together, you have to trust them to some extent. The high point of Bradley's career was Operation Cobra. The Allies after D-Day, you know, we think of the longest day and, and uh, saving Private Ryan. We see that heroic struggle to get across the beaches. But once we were across the beaches, we were stuck in this hedgerow country of Normandy. And we, we couldn't figure out a way to get out. The Germans were just defending too tenaciously. And uh, Bradley came up with this idea for a breakout. And uh, before he unveiled that uh, as a plan, he, uh, he talked it over with his staff. He talked it over with people he trusted. And once he was sure of it, he prepared a very short plan. It was only one page long, and it had a big diagram. And it basically said, here's what we're going to do. And he trusted the people he was working with to understand the plan and to execute and one of Omar Bradley's strengths throughout his life was his ability to put together a great team and let them do their jobs. What do you think his weaknesses were? I think Bradley's greatest weakness was his inability to assert himself. He would oftentimes kind of let events go a little bit further along than uh, he would have liked. Uh, in the case of his armies being moved over to General Montgomery during the Battle of the Bulge, he sort of heard rumblings about that, and he didn't get out in front. He didn't recognize the threat. It's it's almost like what in modern parlance we might talk about the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. He was a little bit slow to get to that when dealing with a, uh, a threat from within. If Eisenhower was going to cut his supplies or move armies to somebody else, Bradley didn't, didn't assert himself as quickly as I think he wished he had in hindsight. Uh, we didn't talk about Eisenhower weaknesses. What do you think his leadership foibles were? You know, Eisenhower was a, is a tough guy to, to be too critical of. The, the big criticism leveled against him by Montgomery, as well as uh, many Americans, including American historians, is that Eisenhower never really had much command experience. And as a result, 
he didn't have what uh, Montgomery called battle grip or the the ability to jump in there and say, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. We're going to all you know, stay faithful to these instructions. The, now, the British were used to very detailed instructions. The American system was to give kind of a broad objective and let your subordinates handle it. And I think the the problem that that Eisenhower ran into occasionally is that things might go a little bit, uh, you know, they they might go a little bit askew, and and he was reluctant to jump back in there. Uh, the Battle of the Bulge was a good example of him kind of uh, taking a laissez-faire approach, and until it was obvious that he needed to jump in there, and uh, he might have jumped in a little bit quicker than he did. So where can people go to learn more about the, your book and the rest of your work, John? Well, uh, the, the book Brothers, Rivals, Victors and its follow-up American Warlord, are, you know, they're available on audio and print at you know, Amazon, Indie Books, the other places where you get books. I've got a Facebook page, uh, Jonathan W. Jordan author page, and website, jonathanwjordan.com. I'd love to hear from you. And what's American Warlord about? American Warlords is uh, kind of the follow-up about the the relationship and how an even more fractious group, Franklin Roosevelt, Secretary of War Henry Stimson, General George C. Marshall, and the irascible Admiral Ernest J. King all worked together. They set aside very deep political, personal, and professional differences and managed to cobble together an alliance with the British that was able to marshal America's resources and defeat fascism, not just in Europe, but also in Asia. Well, I'll have to check that one out. That sounds fantastic. Well, Jonathan, Jordan, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Hey, Brett, a pleasure from here as well. And uh, thank you very much. My guest today was Jonathan Jordan. He's the author of the book, Brothers, Victors, Rivals. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work at jonathanwjordan.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash brothers, victors, rivals, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.